Wall Street Memes Casino. I'm fine. And Sportsbook. This is Colin McGuigan for IFL TV. Joined by Eddie Hearn in Philadelphia. Eddie, straight after the weigh-in. We're not going to go into too much of me bantering you at the beginning because we got a bit of stick for that yesterday. Yeah. But we'll... Uh, We'll talk a little bit about yesterday or about the way in today. So obviously, Pete Dobson. A lot of people are are predicting that likely that is an upset on the card. Really? In your opinion, I mean, the reality is, I don't know enough about Jaleel Hackett. Like being completely honest, like he is eight and zero with seven knockouts, right? Nine and eight knockouts. Eight and seven knockouts. So tomorrow is his ninth fight. Jalil Hackett has never really boxed anyone of note. And Jalil Hackett has never boxed on a stage like this. He is going out as co-main event tomorrow night in front of 14,000 people against Peter Dobson, who is a solid fighter. He ain't a world-class fighter. He's fringe world level, all right? Good 12 rounds against Conor Ben. Soaked it up, took punishment, won a couple of rounds. Crafty, clever. It really comes down to who can hold their nerve on the stage. But I see it as a 50-50 fight, actually. But we'll find out how special Jaleel Hack is. Like you, you know, the American boxing media there again. Eddie Hearns, you know, a lot of people say that you get your fighters beat. No, I just put my fucking fighters in real fights. What do you want? These guys, you know, do you get your fighters beat? Do you want good fights? Yes. Well, then fucking every now and again, someone's going to lose, aren't they? But when I say to Jalil Hackett, who signs a deal with us, what sort of opponent do you want? And his team go, we want a real fight. I say, you sure you want a real fight? Yeah. What about Peter Dobson? In fact, we'll fuck him up. Good. Do you want to go co-main event? This is a stage we're born for. Good. Good luck to you. I can sit there and enjoy it. I don't know. You know, I mean, look, do you want to see great fights? Yes. 50-50 fight for a young prospect? Great. If he gets beat, they'll all go, oh, Eddie Hearns, he threw him into the light. No, I didn't. The team, it's what the team wanted. You told me you were good enough. And if you ain't good enough, you'll lose. But I think he wins tomorrow night. But I think yeah. it's going to be a very, very competitive fight. What made you sign Jaleel Hackett? I talked to him a little bit about his spar, and he sparred with Tank. Obviously, he sparred with Secure as well. And he, he spoke to me about joining him a match room, and he said that Boots told him this is the place to be. Yeah. What made you want Jaleel Hackett? I just like I, I met him at the August 3rd um, Riyadh season press conference in New York. I'd heard about Jaleel Hackett. He's got like a little bit of that, that kind of hardcore following. Do you know what I mean? Where people say he's the next big thing coming out of American boxing. He came over to me. He said he'd like an opportunity to work with Matchroom. He was very polite. He's 21. And I spoke to Boots and I spoke to the guys and I said, look, we don't like Tell me about this kid. He's very good. And that's it. I've watched some of his fights. And I thought to myself, we'll roll. And, and you see, the difference is, what I'm not, what I might not have been interested in, is giving him six fights. Yeah? Four eight-rounders, two tens against no one you've ever heard of. When he said, I'm ready for the test now, that made me say, fair enough. We'll give you the slot. I didn't know this would be co-main event. You know, LeBron pulled out of the fight. All of a sudden, it's a good build-up of the fight. Let's do it. So what a chance for him. Like if Hackett goes in there and destroys Pete Dobson, he's mega. So I love these moments, you know. What's your opinion on Avanissian tomorrow night? A lot of people are kind of saying this is a better fight than Cody Crowley, but some people at the same time, maybe in American particularly, are saying, look, Bud beat him quite easily. Is yeah, it going to be the same I mean, again? I think he had a good fight against Bud. Like He got well beat, but he had a right go, didn't he? And he was tough. He was always throwing. And he'll do that tomorrow night. I, I think that... Um, for me, anyway, this is all about Jerron Ennis. This is all about the performance. This is like, and the problem with these homecomings is I've done a lot of them, and some people don't perform on their homecomings. Like he's been inundated this week, boots with media, with friends, with family. Like he walk out to my night. Hey, look, Bobby Lee, it's my mate. Oh yeah, and like I saw it with Super El Matias. You know, he walks out. And you can't take anything away from Liam's performance, but he's on the ring apron for about twenty minutes. Looking around, oh, man, yeah, well, hey, yeah, yeah. You get in there, you get beat. So I think Jerron is mentally stronger than that. But at the same time, it's all about the performance. Like if this is a 12-round war 
in a close fight, that's no good for us. You've got to be breathtaking tomorrow night. You've got to be sensational. And if he is, the world will put him on the map as one of the biggest stars in the sport. I feel like every time you have a show in America, Oscar De La Hoya has got a little bit of something to say. So he's come out with a few comments over the past 24 hours. First of all, he said that this is like the prelims for Ortiz's fight. What do you make of that? It's weird, isn't it? I mean, Oscar's got this really sick kind of obsession with me. You know? Like, you know, like if you sat down with Oscar and you went to him, Eddie Hearn, Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn, like, like, stop, stop, you know, and just like, imagine that kind of life or mentality where someone can aggravate you so much, having not done anything. I mean, I can't be more complimentary of Oscar de la Hoya. I'd love to work with him more because that's what we should be doing with our platform. But for some reason, I, I grate him so much and I don't know why. Like, what is... Virgil Ortiz, firstly, got to do with Jerome Boots Ennis. I mean, if you want to get petty about it, Virgil Ortiz is fighting in the Michelob Ultra Arena, which holds about 7,000. He won't sell it out anyway. And Boots is doing double the crowd in Philadelphia. But also, Virgil Ortiz is a great fighter. He's on the zone. I mean, if he wants to find out how great Virgil Ortiz is, he can fight Jerome Boots Ennis. And we'll settle it that way if he wants. You know, but I don't, it's weird. Like, I don't, I don't know why you're comparing the shows. You're going to do 5,000. I'm going to do 14,000. Just did Bam Against Estrada, one of the fights of the year. Top five pound for pound in Phoenix. Just sold out in Puerto Rico. We got the Riyadh season event coming up in Los Angeles. One of the biggest shows of the year. Things are great for us. I don't know why, why, why you got to keep talking about me. You know, you seem to be very happy with yourself and your life. Don't worry about it little old Eddie Hearn. He also said last night that if she occurs to fight William Zepeda, yeah. he would have to sign with Golden Boy. Yeah. Did DAZN have anything to say about these comments or is it kind of just... I mean, if I'm DAZN, I'm thinking, why are you stopping fights from happening on our platform? But also, if I'm William Zepeda, I'm thinking, why are you using me to try and sign Shakur Stevenson? Like, Oscar talks a great game about wanting to make all these great fights and promoters need to work together. Now, what, you want to keep a Zapeda fight in-house? I mean, with all due respect to William Zapeda, I think he's really exciting. Shakur Stevenson is the superstar. But you see, the way that people work is Golden Boy will only sign Shakur and give him the Zapeda fight if he signs a long-term deal with Golden Boy. And that's the hook that you don't want. You know, you need to have the fluidity... And with me, I would probably say to Shakur, yeah, we'll try and make this. I think Oscar didn't like the fact that I said, I think he should fight Zapeda. Because, well, you, you can only fight Zapeda if you're with me. That ain't work. But also, for me, if I'm Shakur, I, I, I like to look at it the other way around sometimes. I like to look at it on behalf of Josh Dubin and Jay Prince, who obviously is advisors. What's best for Shakur? The last thing Shakur really wants to do is sign a long-term deal that doesn't deliver him the fights that he needs. Do you know what I mean? So if I'm Shakur, I'm signing a... I think it's, it's hard to do a one-fight deal because there's not many people that would do it. But I'm doing a two- or a three-fight deal with a very short time span so I can be really active. And if I can't have the fights that are delivered for me, I can go elsewhere. Do you know what I mean? That's difficult for the promoter because you've got to make a major investment without actually maybe making a fight that makes any money. You know, but what would the benefit do you be of that? Not not in a rude way, but why would you do that for sure? What of losing money? Yeah. No, that's not the plan. I mean, you know, but I don't mind making an investment. See, I like making investments into great fighters that I think that can beat people, but I need to be able to deliver the fights. Let so, me counter that just with a, for example, Lawrence Acoli, yeah. the way he kind of you made an investment in him and then he moved off. Would you not say at this stage it would be better? Maybe to tie someone like Shakur to a long-term investment to protect yourself from that. I can't believe you just likened Lawrence Cody to Shakur Stevenson. No, I'm not. I'm not liking it. I'm, I'm liking no, the situation of signing someone. Situation. Shakur Stevenson. I know the guys at the Prudential Center. He's just done a massive gate there that no one wants to talk about because they don't want to say how well it's done. Obviously, because he's left. He's just done the biggest rating on ESPN in 2024. He's a pound for pound 
great fighter who is a three division world champion, right? If you're going to invest, you invest in great stock. And Shakur Stevenson is great stock, right? Now, if you can't deliver him the fights, he's going to be expensive and maybe he's going to cost you money. You have to put your big boy pants on and say, am I prepared to back this kid and roll the dice? Now, if I'm going to back a kid on a back a kid that I believe is an is a incredible fighter and I believe he's an incredible fighter, but we also need the relationship and the fluidity that if someone wants to get silly and not work in the best interest of their broadcaster or their fighter or the sport and say, I'm only giving you that fight if you sign with me, then you need the fluidity for me to say, all right, mate, let's go and do it. You know, if PBC say, we're not doing a deal with Matram, say Shakur signs with me, we're not doing a deal with Matram. I don't, like PBC now, they're, they're working with more people. You know, the zone broadcast the Canelo Munguia fight. You know, obviously, Riyadh season, all the, the broadcasters are working together. So I don't see that as the issue. The issue will be who Shakur Stevenson sits down with and wants to be his guy. Do you know what I'm saying? Because at the moment, he's fighting a one-man battle against the world. And it's really tiring and it's draining and he probably doesn't know that yet, but like, you can't keep putting fires out on Twitter and you can't keep fighting battles on Twitter. You've got to go and work hard in the gym, let a, a professional organisation and a promotional machine take over that job for you. Let me be your mouthpiece. Let me go and tell you how great you are to the world. Come tomorrow night to to the to, to, to Wells Fargo and watch what we've done in four months with Jerome Boo Tennis. And he'll know. He'll look around and go, fuck me. I, I know deep down he wants to sign with me. No doubt. But it's got to be right for me. And it's got to be right for him and his career. But I will meet, obviously see him tomorrow night, but I will meet with Josh Dubin and Jay Prince next week. And we'll see if it makes sense for everybody. I nearly, I nearly signed Shakur many years ago with Jay Prince. But what happened there? I lost out to top rank. You know, I was new in the game. It's like four years ago. I think he just turned pro at the time. You know, he started out in the game. And, you know, I met, I met with those guys talking about Shakur. I think it was actually just before his pro debut. And he signed with Top Rank. And I think it was the right decision for him. I think Top Rank had done a good job. Look, he's he's a three-division world champion. So they've, they've done a good job. But, you know, for some reason, they fell out. And once they fell out and he announced that he wasn't going to re-sign, they gave up on him. And I get that as well. Like, I don't think that's unreasonable when someone says, thanks for everything, but I'm off at the end of it. You drop down the priorities. Moving on to Ryan Garcia, if you were his promoter, with everything and everything that's going with what's going on with Ryan Garcia at the moment, how would you handle the situation, Eddie? Depends on the relationship with the fighter. You know, I think if you're if you care about the fighter and you're you have a good personal relationship with the fighter, you do everything you can to keep them safe, um, try and make them happy, and get any help that they need. What I will say is, it's not just as easy as Oscar de la Hoya phoning up Ryan Garcia and saying, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, because I don't think Ryan Garcia is listening to anybody at the moment. It's a very similar situation that I went through with a fighter, where I just saw them implode. And myself, other people tried to get them help, and we couldn't, because they didn't think there was anything wrong with them. Do you know what I mean? And it ended up them imploding to such a horrendous level and that's that's what happens in this situation you have to hit absolute rock bottom and something terrible has to happen before the help comes and the aim of the game is to try and stop that from happening interrupt that with the right people and get the help before something really bad happens and the way things are going something terrible is going to happen and it will be a everybody knew so moment when that happens, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? You know, whenever something terrible happens, the, the signs are always there. You look back over someone's past. Oh, they've had problems there. This happened. Their behaviour changed. Like, this is just what's happening on this path. He's not just going to get better. He's not going to wake up one day and go, sorry about that, guys. Oh, I've had a bit of a, like, a bit of a turn the last three or four months, but I'm all right now. It doesn't work like that. And Ryan, who I've met previously when he was well, He's a, he's a, I think he's a good kid. I think he's got a good heart. 
But if you can't see that he needs help, but sometimes, like at least now you've seen the parents come out and say, but also it's got nothing to do with me. Like, I hope that he can find happiness. And But I always get asked, what do you think about Ryan Sobber? And in the end, it's like, well, why are you asking me? You know, I think the, the reason why we ask you is because you're quite vocal on how you would care for your fighters. And it's comparing that to maybe if how... I, if, I, if I represented Ryan Garcia, I would be doing absolutely everything I could to get him the help that he needs. I don't know if Golden Boy have done that. Maybe they have. I, I have no idea. But just even if they did that, it doesn't necessarily mean that he will get the help because in his head, he's absolutely fine. He, 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 I don't think... I mean, probably you know now he's thinking to himself... But at the same time, I've seen it calmly. I've seen people, but, you know, you get off, you get arrested. You come back, you carry on. Then you do something terrible. Then you go away for time in prison. Something else could happen. Terrible. Like, like anything is possible. In the, the way things are going and the way it's spiraling out of control, something terrible could happen. And the aim of the game is to stop that from happening. But when you think you're fine... You're not going to listen to anyone. It's really, it's really quite difficult because, like I say, things have happened to me in the past where you sort of sit back after and go, could we have done more? Not really. You know, we did that. We got him in there. You know, we tried to, he got out of there. Like we took, we spoke to him. We had meetings with him. We but it comes down to the individual. He's really the only one, you know, unless you're going to be sectioned, which is obviously like a huge you know, thing that is only relevant in certain situations, you have to take yourself to that point. So he has to sit down one day and go, I've, I've got to do this now. So this, fuck off over there and go and get myself right. Because he's got a huge future in front of him. It's a great fire. You know, and hopefully he can he can get it right. Eddie, Chris Eubank Jr. has been called out by Billy Joe Saunders over the past 24 hours. First question to you is, have you had any discussions with Billy Joe Saunders about a comeback? Uh, previously, yeah. And I think that um, it's like the one of my biggest gripes from a fighter is I can't train properly until I know my date. Right? And that's not just Billy. That's all fighters. And it actually winds me right up. Like, you, you, you prepare yourself and, but I also get it, like, you can't focus the mind and train with the same intensity without knowing actually what's happening. The problem with Billy is that until he looks ready to, to legitimately start a training camp with full veracity, he needs to put in a lot of work to get to that point. Do you know what I'm saying? And he probably doesn't want to put in that work till he knows when he's fighting. And I might not want to secure that date until I know, until he will actually be ready or not. Does that make sense? So we're, sooner or later, someone's going to have to either, like I'm going to have to go to him, right, Bill, there's the date. It's all there for you, mate. Don't let me down. Or he has to get in physical condition to start an eight or nine, ten week camp. Say, so look, see, I'm ready. You know what I mean? If so, Eubank doesn't face Canelo, will you reach out to Ben Shalom and say, let's make this fight? Which one? The, the Billy Joe fight? Yeah, but Billy Joe's not with me. So, that, I mean, Ben could make that fight if he wants to, but I like Billy Joe, I'd like to work with him, I think he's got still a lot to give to the sport, but it's been a long time now, uh, but we'll speak to him, like, you know, I think, there's there's big fights out there to be made for Billy Joe Saunders, and he's still a great character, like, and he's a very, very good talent, it'd be interesting to see, having had that much time out of the ring, how he actually looks, because it's a long time. Last one for me, before I let you go, you said yesterday in the interview with me, that, you called Declan Rice, Deck Rice, as if he was your best friend. And actually, since a lot of the England players have been interacting with those, so maybe you are correct and you do call him Deck Rice. I was kind of bantering yesterday that you were like, oh, Deck Rice. What the fuck do you know? When have you ever heard any of his mates or any of the England call, call, call him Declan? He's Deck oh. Rice. Deck. If if we're being honest, he's actually Irish. So what, we, won't get that, we, won't get, we won't get into that discussion. What, what you know? He is Declan Rice, but my question to you is, do you have a word of advice to the players, maybe if they do see this and kind of a rallying call ahead of a massive game on Sunday I against me? I think it's a bit cringe. I keep having to do these things to camera. Like, it is what it is. I, I just think that 
I sent one of them a message the other day and I said, legends. And, they, and the player replied, not yet. And that was after the semi-final, right? Which tells me everything I need to know about their mentality. Like they're winners and only victory against Spain matters. And it, with, all, with all due respect, making the final, it's a great achievement, but it means absolutely fuck all if you're a winner. So what I like about this team is I think it's a team of winners. I think it's a team with a big set of bollocks on them. And I think they've proved that in the, the penalty shootout already. I also, I'm a believer that things are already written. And I think the way that the tournament's mapped out, the way we didn't play great, but we won the group, the way that the, the performances have continued to improve, the fact that Gareth Southgate is actually a good person. And I think he's desperate to win. And the stick that he's had, I just feel like it's all going to come together. So all you can ever do is go out and do your best. And if you're good enough, you win. You need things to go your way. But that's when I talk about things being written. I honestly think it's written that we win tomorrow. But I think we go out and we play fearlessly. That's the key. you know. And, and I think that we've got the players, we've got the mindset. It's going to be a real tough game. But what a fucking... Imagine. I mean, all this, you know, I grew up in an era of his coming home. Right, and imagine if it came home, right? <laughs> because it never fucking comes home, does it? And we say it every major tournament, like the lift that it would give for our country. You know, we've got a new government. You know, I think the country's fucking in the shit. To be honest with you, we've got problems on our streets. These are the kind of actually moments that can really lift the nation, and it'll be an amazing thing. I'm actually gutted that I'm not in England tomorrow, because it will be an amazing day for our country. Win, lose or draw, it'll be an amazing day. But imagine if we won. And like to the players, just go out and like this these, this moment will make you led legends forever in our country. I'm talking about fucking knighthoods all round. You know, I'm talking about national holidays. This is the shit that makes people fucking clean your bum for you for life. You know what I mean? So and Eddie Hearn is cleaning Jude Bellingham's I, bum on Monday. To, if I have to, listen, you've got to do what you've got to do for your country haven't you? But I will say this, like everyone wants to win so bad. So this is, this is like earlier in the tournament when people, we're, we, we're a nation of moaners. I think that's one thing that makes us special. But now we're in this position, honestly, that the, the positive energy of support and belief, because you know Spain will be doing it. Spain won't be moaning. Imagine the support out there in Spain. We are great. We are fucking England. We are such a great country. You know, when you look at Box Park and stuff like that, right? And everyone's getting mental. We're absolute lunatics, but what we do is we love our country. So tomorrow, let's just have one of those days that we will all remember for the rest of our lives, across generations. You know, tomorrow there'll be great moments where people in households, you know, four-year-olds, the mum, the, the grandparents, the great-grandparents, will all be watching it together. And it's a massive day for our country. So good luck, boys. We're very proud of you. I know you're going to do it. Just give it your best. You're winners. You're fucking great players. You've got skills to burn. And you've got massive bollocks on you. So let's get it done. Eddie Hearn, always a pleasure. Thanks, mate. Wall Street Memes Casino. I'm fine. And Sportsbook.